the presentation of anarchism a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation economic social political and spiritual of the human race the emancipation Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Hello, everyone. Uh, today's episode's title is Interpersonal Freedom as Pluralist Radical Horizontality. My name is Elena Pagani. I come from Greece and a working class immigrant family background. Today, I'm going to share some ideas from my doctoral thesis titled Organizing Equal Freedom from Antagonism to Agonism. The ideas I present today derive from a situated feminist intersubjective militant research of radical worker cooperatives in Greece. This is a politically pluralist organizing space. I, or better we, started from practice a particular local assembly process to go to theory for help to go back and inform practice. For the people that are interested in refigurative politics and anarcho-feminist utopias, and possibly the politics of the commons, my hope is that what I share today resonates with you and provides some inspiration that develops our thinking on anarchist practice and theory with, within, and beyond the Greek context. I embarked on this research for two main reasons. One was the Groundhog Day of our collective organizing in Greece, with these amin loops of political stagnation. Equally important and inseparable from the first reason was the violence of oppression that informal hierarchies bring in our collectives. Joe Freeman has captured this violence well, both in tyranny of structurelessness and trussing, and anarcho-feminist authors have done the same in, for example, quiet rumors. The collection. If the distinctive political practice that anarchy has to offer is equality and freedom, or equal freedom, it seems that we still cannot figure out how to bring how to bring it to our practices on the interpersonal level when one meets another, another one in our collective spaces. We write about the personal and we write about the collective. But what about the interpersonal? I think an answer to this question and thinking on the interpersonal within our groups might give us all a better chance to sustain our activism, our collectives and ourselves against the rising dystopia and its detrimental effects on our psyche. The not rare emotionally intense internal conflicts in horizontally organized collectives call for the creation corresponding processes that will give space to the discussion of interpersonal problems. Without processes that allow us to be emotionally attuned, reflective, and connected to each other and the problems we face, it would be difficult to identify forms of self and interpersonal oppression, including psychological forms. Forms very difficult to perceive, deconstruct, and transform to the extent possible. The hierarchy of inequalities will prevail. Although my main focus in in this militant research was to develop an interpersonal process of freedom that I have termed pluralist radical horizontality, what appears as a practice and theory gap, the main reason I included and developed further ideas of personal freedom using the work of many anarchist theorists, was the realization, while doing fieldwork, that if we cannot find an intrapersonal process of freedom when we meet, even if we have the best interpersonal and collective practices, 
we will enter them unavoidably without an alternative. With our individualistic and therefore hierarchical intrapersonal organizing persisting. This is a problem discussed usually as informal hierarchies. Therefore, within prefigurative politics, thinking on how we could do equality and freedom in anarchist theory and horizontal practices, as if in an anarcho feminist utopia, my talk today is going to be about practices and theorizing of what I have termed pluralist radical horizontality. I chose this conception as a different way to discuss what usually goes as anti-hierarchical, anti-oppression practices, or sometimes as restorative justice practices. The choice of pluralist came from the desire to broaden what participates in our collectives and give rigid militancy a shake. Some, as Nathan June, use the term diverse. Another reason I chose pluralist was, as, was because the Greek cooperatives of this militant research are politically rural spaces. A final reason why I chose pluralist radical horizontality instead of anti-hierarchy is to draw focus to prefiguring an anarchist utopia more and resisting to the dominant masculine hierarchical organizing less. Additionally, thinking of the etymology of anarchy in Greek, radical horizontality could maybe be seen as closer to anarchy than anti-hierarchy and anti-oppression. A means without in Greek and not anti or non. Furthermore, if we were to interpret archi as power, then in prefiguring an anarchist utopia, it could mean that all forms of power would be equal. If all forms of power were equal, then a discussion on power in an anarchist utopia would be redundant. We would do without power. There would be anarchy between all forms of being. Can we imagine such a utopia? How can we prefigure it then? Nonetheless, unfortunately, we do not yet live in such a utopia. And if we would, it would be ever beautifully imperfect and ever evolving. Therefore, what I present tries to account for both processes of prefiguration and processes of resistance. Again, I will be talking about these processes on the personal and interpersonal level within collectives that aspire and practice such anarchist utopian practices in the now. In short, to resist the detrimental effects of the rising dystopia, and in particular the psychological impact, understanding interpersonal interactions within our collectives could be a way that sustains our organizing. The ideas I present try to continue post-anarchist conversations or inequality and freedom. I developed these propositions commencing from Nathan June's 2011 work on power, equality and freedom. This is the book Anarchism and Political Modernity. I bring June's thinking on equality and freedom as diverse be and diverse do, these are his terms, together with anarchist con conceptions and processes of freedom as reflective self-creation. These include Alex Kipkioli's agonistic self-creation self work and Nate Eisenstadt's 2013 doctoral study on intrapersonal conflicts in creating the self and agency in anarchist collectives. I will go into theory now for the reason that the particular perspectives helped us in setting up collective processes in the Greek settings. There were aha moments in reading them in terms of challenges we faced in our groups and how to go about it. Kipchulis' agonistic self-creation discusses intrapersonal resistance processes to dominant mainstream social conditioning 
using Foucault amongst others. Kipiolis offers an elaborate account of the elements making up the process of self-creation, namely critical reason, reflection, deliberation and imagination, and their particular workings. This includes his idea of agonism that brings together Foucault and Castoriadis. He also offers an elaborate account of the exact aims of this process, which empowers the self against com- compulsions of social conditioning, covering a broad scope of freedom practices, such as decisions and their determining grounds, elements of self-identity, guiding principles and goals, and internalized notions of the normal, the permissible, and the feasible. Side by side with resistance, Kyolis brings intrapersonal processes of prefiguring the new. Pluralist radical horizontality would be such an example of new. He's using Castoriadis' concept of the imaginary to do so. The Castoriadian imaginary allows for the new to emerge and emerge not ex nihilo. I will move now to Nate Eisenstadt's work. Eisenstadt's insights also allows us to think on the intrapersonal level. What talks to activist experiences from his work are the nuances of internal struggles he discusses in choosing between different conceptions of freedom in our intra-group organizing. He brings to the front dilemmas that take the form of internal confrontation. Do we choose to enact freedom as radical desire or as our collective equality asks Eisenstein? While he critiques that the actual problem in the formation freedom options begin and end within conceptions of freedom as sovereignty. Sovereignty means the one subject that strives for absolute freedom over others. This means that either radical desire or collective equality, and not both. For me, what is interesting when we have these dilemmas is to think on whether our final choice is based on hierarchical thinking, meaning that one is better, more important, more useful, more righteous, more militant, more anarchist than the other. Wouldn't that be hierarchical thinking? And I'm not saying here that we should not think instrumentally at times. I chose these dilemmas or polarizations, or binaries, as some people, some other people might call them, as from my experience, this sort of internal and interpersonal confrontations, where one option needs to survive and dominate over all others, is what breaks our collectives. People get tired to be put down and just go. Usually silently. I mean, this is how mainstream organizing works. No? Let's find another way. The conversations and theorizing I just outlined discuss equality and freedom as a personal practice within a collective. The focus is the one subject or the one form of being dominating. The account for intrapersonal processes of resistance to the oppression of hierarchies within an individual. This is Einstein's Eisenstadt's dilemma. The individual internal process movement between different practices with the aim to choose the best one. The one and its process of dominance is where I think the problem lies. I term the internal process of self-creation between different forms of being that think things in hierarchies, for example, collective quality is better than radical desire, antagonistic. Another example of this intrapersonal process would be the internal antagonism between something more common in collective decision-making, like the antagonism involved in choosing between fast and slow, or between rationality and emotions, or between theory and experience, or between result and process. 
The intrapersonal process tries to evaluate and choose better and worse in terms of power and instrumentality. My argument here is that if we accept fast and slow as having different amounts of power in radically horizontal refigurative politics, rather than equal amount or rather than amount not making any difference, then the internal process one goes through towards being and doing is antagonistic and stays constrained in instrumentality and mainstream hierarchical social conditioning. I argue that this antagonistic process needs to be resisted or at least not dominate in our internal organizing. Otherwise, what is it that we radically change? Can we dismantle the master's house with the master's tools? Maybe we can, maybe not. Or maybe we can do our own thing, at least to the extent we still can. My proposition of pluralist radical horizontal processes tries to go beyond the we are equal members of a collective taking decisions horizontally. The absence of formal hierarchies that not, does not equal horizontality. Intrapersonal and interpersonal antagonistic processes persist. This phenomenon is usually discussed as informal hierarchies. And as I mentioned, anarcha-feminist discussions have used intersectionality as a lens to see through this problem, while at the same time, their suggestions that the personal is political seems to not sink in our intra-group organizing. Informal leaders just prevail, and they prevail in most contexts, and not just the Greek one. Do we want to keep reproducing these oppressive interactions and not to the mainstream? I guess the answer is no. But then why does it happen? One of the conclusions of this research that I've mentioned was that the way we perceive the political and what is political has to do with this problem persisting and slowly eating away our collectives. Therefore, my propositions on intrapersonal and interpersonal processes of pluralist radical horizontality aim to reclaim the interpersonal as political. In the same way that confederations are political or political groups are political, the interpersonal is political. Let's see now what I mean with such interpersonal political processes of pluralist radical horizontality. I will go back to theory to do that. Building on June's equality and freedom as diverse be and diverse do, a radically horizontal process would be one where different forms of being would be negotiated internally for the individual as well as interpersonally as if they did not carry unequal power. Choosing to be or to do between fast and slow would be relevant of their conventional power status, while at the same time the idea is not to choose one between the two, but to see how fast and slow can both find some space in personal processes of being and doing. To put it simply, it involves seeing fast with slow, rather fast against slow, or slow against fast. In the example of writing an essay, like this one, I see the points I move slow and the points I move fast. I do that while resisting at the same time the social conditioning that fast is powerful and the faster I move, the more powerful I will become, while always in a state of shame that I'm not faster or the fastest. I could instead think how much I enjoy the slow and the fast beats and how they both make my writing what it is. In this process, one form of being, one subject, winning, would be relevant and redundant as power would be. Finally, in this weaving in of fast and slow, I argue, the various forms of being stay distinct and do not merge one into the other. This is to achieve the anarchist balance between the personal and the collective. 
the personal stay and their weaving makes up the collective. We have a salad and not a smoothie. The final element I add here in terms of radical horizontality is making the quantity of fast and slow power irrelevant too. To put it simply, this is the problem of I am the fastest or I am not fast enough. Would quantity of forms of being matter in an anarchist utopia? And I'm not talking here about quantities in doing together instrumental tasks, such as cooking. And although cooking is important, I focus on utopia just to help us imagine, rather than proposing a new elitist, Puritan state or blueprint disconnected from the material struggles of everyday life. The idea I just presented started not from theory, but from our problems, from the problems in our groups, and bringing in theory to help. What appeared key during fieldwork was transforming the logic of confrontation between forms of being to a weaving between the various forms of being. What appeared to transform confrontation in the ground was reflection and deliberation on how we think and how we feel, and on the relationship between means and ends. It was questions like, why am I so fixated on theory leading? Or some personal psychological digging around parental discipline that punished spontaneity and creativity, creating a similar fixation. We move next from personal agonistic self-creation as a freedom process to interpersonal freedom processes that I termed agonistic empathy. Prior to developing agonistic empathy, this conception, my aim while doing fieldwork was to understand better what happens when people meet and do things together inside the collective. The focus was not the subject, but the subjects. In developing a theoretical conception, my intention here was bold. It was to shatter to the ground the dominant perception that one's freedom needs to go against another so as as not to be restricted. This is subjection or elimination of the other. My intention was also to shatter the mentality of Tina in the form of inescapability of power inequalities, which I perceived as inseparable to hierarchical organizing. Are they inescapable? Or is it that we have not yet imagined an exit from inescapability? Would power inequality stay inescapable in an anarchist utopia? I found profound inspiration in thinking and developing this interpersonal account in Kropotkin's mutual aid idea the radical idea of helping each other become more powerful. Or a better articulation for my discussion here, the radical idea to help each other become non-dependent on ideas of power that affect our processes of being and doing. Therefore, I developed the the conception of agonistic empathy as an interpersonal and intersubjective account of freedom. Again, I developed this conception starting from the Greek situated practice and the the particular tension surrounding it. This was the local assembly process. Here, I I bring in two key theoretical accounts. The first one is Edith Stein's phenomenological types of relationality, emotional included, in a collective. I used her account to discuss how to prefigure radical, radically horizontal interactions. The second account is Heinz Kohut's psychoanalytic process of introspection and empathy for resisting hierarchical processes and their psychological effects. I'll go back to Stein again. 
Edith Stein's work appears mostly undiscovered in radical political theorizing. Why did I go for phenomenology? First, since I wanted to bring in emotional elements in prefiguring anarchy, we thought we would need something different from psychoanalysis. Furthermore, phenomenology, I thought, could help in imagining whatever it is that we want to prefigure as if without connection or dependency to social, historical, and so on structures. In addition, a phenomenological ontology, I thought, might also be helpful in the sense of finding something different to desire. Desire in its objects and in, a, in an intersubjective interpersonal account of freedom, seeing the other as an object of desire, appear to get in the way. So I thought that maybe phenomenological intentions can help us imagine differently. I will now go into more detail in Edith Stein's work to present two ways we can use to understand how interpersonal interactions can take form, hierarchical and radically horizontal, within a collective. Just to say here that Edith Stein wrote in the 1920s. Stein proposes to understand community as the natural organic union of individuals, whereas association for her is a union that is rational and mechanical. She makes this distinction to move into another distinction, subject to object and subject to subject. To explore the subject to, so to object and subject to subject relationships, towards a discussion of community, she brings in what she calls the association man and the community man. She uses being with and feeling with to discuss the interactions of the community man, and she uses being together and feeling together to discuss the interactions of the association man. The association man lives together with others. And she points out here that with this man, the bond of solidarity is severed. His aim is to turn others into objects, make them subservient to his purposes. To achieve this for Stein, the association man observes and calculates. He needs to approach others first as subjects, hence masking oneself as a community man, using intimacy as a way to turn them into objects. For her, the association man rationally takes advantage of what community life offers him. He makes everyone else's inwardness into an object, and he exploits this knowledge for the purposes of his transactions. Her description seems not far from discussions on autonomous sovereignty, and that sovereign subjects subjectification and elimination processes of others. Her counterform is the community man. The second man lives with others. Spontaneity, as opposed to calculation, seems to be a key characteristic of this form of subject and a key differentiator from the previous form. The community man behaves ingeniously without calculating the effects of his demeanor and artlessly receives impressions without initiating surveillance. Her conclusion is that community is possible without association, but not association without community. In short, the inter interpersonal process I just presented is similar to the intrapersonal one. In the examples of radical desire and collective equality, fast and slow, or rationality in emotions, or between theory and experience, or between results and process, if the interpersonal process is a rational confrontation towards one form of being winning over another, power over, and this confrontation happens due to the view that one form is perceived to have more power, meaning it's better or worse or bad or good, then we reproduce hierarchical organizing which are termed as antagonistic. 
to refer to the movement between various forms of being, two or more. If there is a width, a weaving in between forms of being, irrespective of power, then this would fall under pluralist radical horizontality and the movements between the different forms as agonistic. In order to resist antagonistic processes on the interpersonal level, apart from Stein's work that can frame both antagonistic and agonistic movements, I also brought Heinz Kohut's psychoanalytic perspective on introspection and empathy. The reason for bringing in particularly Kohut was multifold. First, a psych- psychoanalytic account can account for psychological elements of oppression, suppression, and resistance to structures. I also like his critique to Freud's disembodied intellectualism and his proposition of a broad variety of ingredients of the empathic process, all as equal. Finally, his empathic process reads simply and as such is more accessible and it could potentially be used as a facilitation method um, in our collectives. Let's let's explore now how agonistic empathy could work with an example. Let's imagine one person insists and insists that political theory is what should lead our actions, while others say that political theory is good, but experience is as good as is intuition, as is affect, as are rules. If that one person insists and insists, then another person could could just say, Hey mate, we do not think in hierarchies here, that one thing is better than others, and one thing should lead the way. Another can show curiosity and say, Okay, tell me more why political theory should be the the one and only thing that guides our actions. Another could say, Thinking and acting only upon terms of abstraction is a masculine form of organizing. Feminine forms are excluded if we only go for that way. Are you interested in understanding more about feminine forms? Another can propose an example of how political theory can be weaved in with other propositions toward taking a particular decision on action. Another can acknowledge the emotional relationalities at play, for example, impatience and strictness in the person proposing the one form that creates emotions of guilt and shame for the others that are not as good in theoretical knowledge. They could also ask that person to acknowledge their emotions and reflect whether it comes from some perception that sees the world in hierarchies. Another can share knowledge on psychoanalysis to tentatively read what they think is going on, and so on. In summary, every member brings whatever they think they can share with the one that insists on the rule of one to aid him towards pluralist and radically horizontal process that creates a weaving. I will end my talk, finally, with a so what. Asking, why is the process I propose even important? Thinking and doing politics on the interpersonal level differently could be just an answer. Let's just experiment with alternatives. At least we give Tina a kick. Another reason has to do with how we appear to do things at the moment to a less conscious and less explicit extent. From this research and from my experience in organizing, we appear to reproduce the violence that hierarchical organizing and antagonistic processes carry inside our collectives. We reproduce the feelings of shame, guilt and constant inadequacy, the feeling of not being enough militant, enough anarchist, the feeling of being alone we appear to reproduce the state of constant and strict surveillance as if under the gaze and the pointed finger of some invisible informal leader. 
This invisible surveillance can take the forms of Starhawk's archetypes of the alternative conqueror, orderer, judge, punisher, and master of servers, servants. It is the feeling that we're always watched but never seen. The feeling that nobody really cares. The feeling of fear that if we don't obey and comply to some invisible alternative rules, we will be punished or worse, be cut off our collectives and our social lives. How could we sustain ourselves when this organizing intensifies outside our groups while we struggle to find an alternative inside? And all this while, while we all struggle more and more to make ends meet. With the two propositions I made on the personal and interpersonal level outcome of this militant research, my hope is that we could maybe stand a chance to sustain ourselves, our collectives and our activism against the dystopia that seems to be closing down on us. Antagonism cannot prevail. Thank you. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.